in the J report, it highlights the sexual exploitation uh, that went on in Rotherham. And I got how many boys in that report were highlighted as experiencing child sexual exploitation in Rotherham? How many? And everybody goes zero. The answer is 80. And people don't know that. Why don't people know that? Because we focused on the girls. That's why. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today we're delighted to welcome along Phil Mitchell, who's a psychotherapist specialising in working with boys and men who've experienced recent and or historic sexual abuse, rape, sexual violence or sexual exploitation. And he's been doing this since 2004. Mm-hmm. Phil himself experienced sexual exploitation as a child and rape as a young adult. He's an experienced public speaker and has trained thousands of professionals across the country on male sexual abuse and exploitation, addressing how masculinity can play a part and help boys and men deal with abuse. Between 2009 and 2018, Phil was the project coordinator of a male-only child sexual exploitation service, and he was instrumental in the development of a nationally recognised male child sexual exploitation resource and provided support to a sexually exploited boy, which was highlighted in the Serious Case Review. Phil has appeared on TV and in the media on numerous occasions, highlighting the abuse of boys and men, and has contributed to various research and publications addressing male child sexual exploitation. Really delighted to have you here today. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I feel really nice to meet you. Yeah, so you too. Can we begin perhaps by, can you tell us something about yourself and how you came to be specialising in this particular area? Um, well, there's a few answers to that question, really. So I, I, I kind of fell into it. So um, I started doing my counselling training in 2000 and. Uh, for when uh, I started volunteering as a as a as a therapist, counselor, psychotherapist, whatever word you want to use, um, and interestingly, the, the the places where I was volunteering were not specialist services to work with uh, boys and men who'd been sexually abused. They were bereavement services. But I just kind of found that for some reason, I ended up working with a number of of men who had been sexually abused as children, uh, some as adults, um, and that that kind of made me think about my own uh, rape that happened when I was, uh, well, just before I was 21. Um, and I kind of thought maybe I could get into this and do some more of this because actually I think I, I'm kind of feeling passionate about this. Over the years, my passion extended into the inequalities and disadvantages boys and men face within the field of sexual abuse, but also wider as well. Um, I should probably say within all of this, um, I was, um, as Naomi mentioned, I was sexually exploited at at 16, but it took me years after that incident to realise that what had happened to me at 16 was sexual exploitation. So it's all a little bit sort of higgledy-piggledy, the timeline in my head. But I guess now it's it's the a big part of what I do, or you know, certainly social media and commenting on things is is the inequalities that are facing male victims. Um, but now, uh, as I said, so I've been working with boys and men who've been affected by different types of abuse just over seventeen years. Uh, in the last sort of four or five years, I've done it full time a lot. Um, so that's a lot, most of my work and a lot of what I do. Um, and yeah, I guess that's that's just a bit about me. I do a lot of training, but because of COVID, we've done it all online with webinars. And I also supervise practitioners that are uh, working with um, abused people and working with vulnerable people in the field of abuse and things like that. Thanks very much, Phil. Why do you think specialist services are needed for men and boys who have been victims of sexual crime? Well, it's an, it's an interesting question. I don't, I'm not always sure that that specialist services are always needed. It's more about the approach. So in 2014, Bernardo's did some research with um, Natsen, the Nuffield Foundation, and maybe some more whose names I can't remember right now. Um, But um, the interesting findings from some of that research was, it was a question. So do we, should we have male only services or should we have services working with um, girls and boys that sort of value and appreciate sort of the male side of things. 
Um, and I think that there wasn't really a clear answer. And to date, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been a clear answer. I think for me, regardless of whether you're a service working with just boys and men or a service working with girls and women and boys and men, it's about making sure that you um, adopt what I would call a pro male positive approach to sort of boys and men and masculinity. There are services that I've been aware of that obviously I will not name, but they have worked with, for example, girls and boys, and they've adopted a very your body, your choice, pro feminine, um, empowering girls and women approach. But with boys and men, it's very, you know, it's all right. You don't have to be masculine and, you know, just express your feelings, just be a bit more like girls and, and talk and open up a little bit more. And, 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 and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that approach necessarily, but too rigidly applied, it ignores all the research and the, the emerging literature on actually masculinity. It can be a great thing. It can be an amazing thing. I'm certainly not the most masculine guy in the world, but I, I, I kind of, you know, after reading various literature and huge amounts of research, is about, well, actually masculinity can be a very good thing. Uh, and is a very good thing, in fact. Um, so I think that in answer to your question, I think whether you whether it's a service working with girls and boys um, or just girls or just boys, it's it's about making sure that you don't come at it. You don't come from this automatic place that goes boys and men are bad. We're going to make them better. That's the problem. Boys and men are not stupid. They will see things. They'll sense things. Um, so it's about making sure that if you are a service working with males and females, that you acknowledge what the science says, that you acknowledge what all the emerging literature says, that generally speaking, and I'll pick my words very carefully in case anyone's, you know, the cancel culture lot come out, but I think what we have to do is acknowledge that girls and women, generally speaking, prefer a certain approach, and boys and men, generally speaking, prefer a certain approach. And I'm, again, I'm saying averages, generals. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think I get quite annoyed because we seem to live in a culture that goes, oh, well, no, that's really bad, isn't it, that boys and men want this and girls and women want this. And the answer is no, it's not bad at all. A lot of the times it's just natural. It's how it is. I think what happens is you do get services that say to boys and men, sit down, open up, express your emotions, et cetera, et cetera. And this sort of entrenched belief under that is often, well, it works for girls and women. Why aren't boys and men doing it as well? And when boys and men don't do it or they struggle to do it, some will jump straight onto, oh, it's patriarchy, it's toxic masculinity, it's all of the nice buzzwords that the sort of misandrists like to throw around. But it's like, well, actually, no, it, it's not that at all. If you are using that approach with boys and men and they talk and they open up, fine. But if they don't, don't assume there's something wrong with the boys and men. What you need to do is take a step back and think, maybe there's something wrong with the approach I'm using. And I should not automatically be assuming that that approach, just because it generally works with girls and women, should always work with boys and men. And again, I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of the, you know, there's some great books that have been out in recent years, the Palgrave Handbook of Male Psychology, um, 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 John Barry and Louise Lydon's book on perspectives in male psychology and things like that. all of the science and the common sense that's in there. It's going, actually, yeah, you can see why a lot of boys and men would prefer that action orientated, solution focused sort of approach. But I think historically and still today, to some degree, is what we say is, well, if boys and men want that approach, isn't that really bad? And the answer again is, well, no, not necessarily at all. It can be really useful as long as the approach is ethical and it's safe and it gets these people to the point where something useful happens. Great. So that's that's I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm waffling on it as I do here. But I think in answer to your question, David, it would be that it, it, I don't think we necessarily need a, a service that works with just boys and men to support just boys and men it's about making sure that whatever the service is they don't approach boys and men from this place of that they're bad they're in hell they're inherently abusive their masculinity is toxic we're going to pathologize them and if they they kind of peddle this oversimplified narrative of female victim male perpetrator it, it's about hang on let, let's kind of take a step back and think how can we make our service not just accessible and inclusive to girls and women but also to boys and men Good. Yes, I can see that. But what would a, a, a kind of male friendly therapy look like? Um, well, it's really interesting. I'm quite embarrassed to say this, but a few years ago, I, I was very much of the opinion that, well, let's just help these boys and men express their emotions and, and talk about their feelings and, and, and talk and talk. And, and I'm still for that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But in addition to that, 
it's also I think for me about accepting that many boys and men arguably on average boys and men will come to therapy and they will want action they'll want solutions they will want those you know it's those sorts of words so for example a few years ago um after um kind of doing a little bit of reading i kind of thought hang on a minute maybe what i'm doing is i'm not acknowledging that boys and men generally want this approach and there's nothing wrong with that what i did is i changed my website i used lots of different wordings so rather than having a part of my website that would say um come to therapy and express your emotions i changed it to come to therapy take action and take control i saw a significant increase in men phoning me texting me and getting in touch and most of them were saying well it's because of that wording it's all about we're not just going to sit here and talk we're going to do something we're going to talk about what action we can take and so on there's also something about um again acknowledging the elements of 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 what martin seager calls archetypal masculinity and actually acknowledging how those elements can be quite positive in therapy so for example if um, a guy is sitting opposite me and he goes well i'm just a failure aren't i i'm a failure i'm here and it shows i need help and that means i'm weak and i just can't deal with a problem i'm not in control uh whilst you know good therapists would empathize with that and accept that's how the client feels you could also say, and maybe another way of looking at it could be that even though this is really difficult for you, it's not something that feels comfortable for you and it's difficult, but you've still gone ahead and done it. You've still made that decision. You're still putting yourself in that place where you're doing something that doesn't come easy to you. Uh, and you're doing that because you're trying to take control of your situation. To me, that sounds more like strength than weakness. And often what you're reframing, basically, but you're reframing using archetypal elements of masculinity. And a lot of boys and men often go, Ah, I never thought of it like that. Well, no, of course you didn't think about it like that because you've got the media and everyone kind of going on and on and on it. You're saying you're bad because you're a man and let's pathologize your masculinity rather than going, well, actually, let's look at it in a different way. And yes, you could display elements of your masculinity in a harmful way, but you could also display them in a really positive way. It's not the masculinity that's bad. It's it's the masculinity. It's the masculinity. It's there. It's natural. It's how it's interpreted and how it's put across. So it's about uh, acknowledging those male-friendly methods. And I've said, you know, there's lots of research out there. There's lots more emerging. There's quite a lot of literature, you know, action, doing. There's certain phrases I will use with men where I say, you know, well, actually, I guess what I'm hearing is you, you try to take action. You try to take control of that situation. You are you are fighting against this. And um, I find, generally speaking, that most boys and men I work with engage with that language and it helps them to open up, as we say. It helps them get to that place where they can take the right sort of action. Um, sometimes as well, and I'm in the early stages of doing this, there's a, a, a new I say new concept, relatively new in the grand scheme of things, called walk and talk therapy. Now, years ago, this was quite frowned upon, and I think now we're becoming a little bit more open-minded. Um, but, you know, the, the really interesting thing is a lot of boys and men prefer to talk and address problems shoulder to shoulder rather than eye to eye. And so I'm doing a bit of training and understanding that because I actually think a lot of guys I have worked with or have expressed interest in working with will might, might talk more and explore their issues in an interesting way if we are walking shoulder to shoulder rather than eye to eye. So, again, it's just acknowledging what the science says, acknowledging what the findings say and, and not assuming that just because boys and men on average may engage in therapy or support slightly differently to girls and women on average that that's a bad thing it doesn't have to be good it's just different thank you that's that's great now i've got a bit of a confession to make because i was searching my memory uh prior to starting today and uh, uh so i was a psychotherapist working with individuals for 20 odd years and i couldn't remember um any any person who'd been referred to me i had many men referred to me i uh, couldn't remember anyone who'd experienced um sexual abuse and and i was wondering about that i was slightly perturbed about it and i was wondering phil do you think this is one of those situations where something isn't seen until somebody has first seen it Mm, it's an interesting one I think when we talk about boys and men this is where there is a difference so in um, one of Richard Gartner's books on um, healing and understanding I think it's called sort of sexual abuse of, of boys and men he talks about three 
uh, he talks about sort of barriers to disclosing, barriers to making reports, barriers to engaging with support. But the, uh, and there are similarities, of course, between men and women victims. Uh, but when it comes to boys and men, there are three specific um, barriers, if you like, that that really do relate to them as as, as boys and men. First one is um, a, th- a threat, the threat to their masculinity. So it's like my masculinity is being threatened. Whether it is or isn't is is a different subject, but it's like, I believe my masculinity is being threatened. So actually now, if I disclose, that's me saying I'm weak, my masculinity takes another knock. If I engage with support, that means I'm weak, my masculinity takes another knock. Again, we can, as I said a moment ago, we can reframe that as strength. So these issues around masculinity or rather perceptions and rigid perceptions around the masculinity. Second one is issues around being gay. Uh, I'm a gay, confusion around sexuality. Will people think I'm gay or that? Some argue that's a bit of mass, sometimes linked to masculinity, but I'm not sure, so sure. But it's about, again, will people think I'm gay? You know, if I was raped by a man, I got an erection. Does that mean I enjoyed it and all of that? So, you know, I'm going to be seen as gay. And the third one is false allegations. And whilst it's a very perhaps controversial issue, there are uh, many men, and I'm sure we'll, you'll very easily meet online, who, who have been... Uh, abused by a partner uh, someone they live with or someone else but they have been abused by a partner but the the idea that they could be the ones that are labeled as or seen as the perpetrator rather than the victim stops them from actually disclosing as well and there's other issues as well now and they're they're the three main ones in my experience and backed up by Gartner's work about how these are relevant to sort of boys and men and so this is why I think the other thing as well is that um there are probably clients that we've all worked with who have been sexually abused, but they don't know it. They've no idea. They don't recognize it as abuse. I was sexually abused at 16 and it took me uh, 13 years to actually realize that what happened at 16 was abuse. And that's only because I was working for a service where I could see similarities between the boy I was working with at the time and what happened to me, and I could very easily see, well, hang on, what's happening to him is obviously sexual abuse. There were differences, but I could see those similarities, and it, I had to take the emotion out of it, take a step back, look at this quite methodically and rationally, going, yeah, I was sexually abused. That's when it really hit me, because that's when I realised. And I often say there's, there's three kind of parts of this. You've got the abuse happens, the abuse is acknowledged, the abuse is responded to. So, for example, and this isn't the case with everyone, of course, I'm, you know, this is just one time. So you've got perhaps... Um, at 16, I was sexually exploited, and that's what actually happened. I didn't know at the time that's what it was. I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't have the education. I thought abuse was when a big, strong man pushes a woman down and rapes her. That was the only thing I thought. But it happened then. Years later, that's when I acknowledged that that was abuse. Yeah. And that's when it's like, wow. And that's when it can hit you. It's like, oh my God, I've been a victim. I've been abused. What does that mean? Oh my God, how do I deal with it? Right. Again, some will go, yeah, that was horrible, but I'm okay now but at least acknowledge it, right? Then you've got the third bit, which is I'm now going to respond to and deal with that abuse. Now, it might be that you don't need to respond to it all. A lot of people are, have, have their own resilience and they go, it happened, it was horrible, but I'm okay now and I'm all right. Others will uh, attach a meaning and go, well, it means I'm weak, so I'm going to show strength, it, all sorts of things. So you've got the abuse happens, the abuse is acknowledged, the abuse is responded to. All of that can happen within the same hour, it can all happen over a, a period of 10 years. So there's all of that. Now, when we talk about boys and men and we talk about perceptions of masculinity, fear of being accused to be the the, uh, the perpetrator when you're the victim, false allegations, uh, worries around being gay, all of that can also then affect things. So it's not only that, that boys and men, boys and men are less likely to recognise that they've been abused. They're less likely to be identified as victims. They're less likely to um, engage with services and they're less likely to disclose. So all of that together is is why we often see a lot more, or certainly in my opinion, I should say, why we see a lot more girls and women making disclosures and getting help than we do boys and men. And even when they do disclose, even if they do get the right support, they're often sent to a service or they are, I should say, sometimes sent to a service that pathologizes them. And, and so there's all these problems here. And I'm really keen to, you know, we, we, you know, you only have to pick up a newspaper at the minute to read something negative about men are bad, men are the problem and all of that. Um, and it's, it's quite hateful and quite rigid. 
Um, and often when I get into certain debates with people on Twitter, which I should probably avoid, <laughs> um, often what I hear is, yeah, but it happens more to women. It happens more to women. It happens more to women. And I say, um, factually and statistically and accurately speaking, women disclose it more. They engage with services more. That does not mean for an absolute fact it's happening more to them. And if we look at, if we learn from what the CDC in America said a few years ago, the number of um, men being forced to penetrate was at similar rates to the number of women who were raped. Yeah. Uh, over here, we, the, we have the ON Office of National Statistics. We have the Crime in England and Wales survey and all of that. They do not at any point in their questioning ask about being forced to penetrate. Those words are not in there. They don't ask them. So there's something about the language that we are using. And there is quite a lot of uh, literature and research on how boys and men don't engage with what we might call victim type language. So if we really want to get an accurate picture, we've got to think about how what we're doing to get that data. And are we actually using methods that are arguably more successful to engage girls and women than boys and men? I would say, yeah. What are we doing about that? Well, not much is the answer. And what we're doing is, well, we'll, we'll look at all these um, girls and women who are reporting the, the abuse, horrible, horrific, and of course they are worthy and deserve support. But what we are not, what we're doing is we are assuming that because the Office of National Statistics presents certain data, that that is all we need to know. That tells us the full picture. No, it doesn't. Not at all. It's one source that is using certain arguably problematic methods to gather data. And those methods, I would say, are not necessarily accessible to boys and men. But what we have is we have certain individuals going, well, no, that's all we need to know. We're not even going to bother or even ask why more boys and men aren't disclosing will just assume that it's not happening to them and it's happening more to girls and women. And it's like, well, actually, we should not just assume that because domestic abuse, sexual abuse, it's just so easy to stay hidden. And so we have to consider all this as well. I don't know if I answered your question there. I think I went off on a bit of a tangent. Well, I think I think you gave a very good, um, <clears throat> a very good uh, summary of the position of the abusee. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly your reflections upon self-awareness and perspective. But I was also thinking that uh, probably the same obtains for the therapist or indeed the service, mm-hmm. um, that a degree of understanding and sensitivity and self-awareness uh, is required before you can engage with such uh, people. Mm. I think it's an interesting point about recognition, isn't it? Because I, th- I think, you know, there are women and girls who also might not recognise that they've been exploited at times. But I think because women's accounts are a lot more visible, certainly online and in the media, that actually that something can resonate and people can realise that actually that's quite similar to my own experiences. <clears throat> and I think I think one of the ways that we worked around that in the service that I, I led for a period of time was that rather than ask people whether they'd been sexually abused, we asked them... Uh, more factual questions like at at what age were you when you had your first sexual relationship and how old was your sexual partner Mm -hmm. which then allowed a bit of perspective a bit of objectivity that allowed for more curious questioning about things and actually ended up with uh, a very high um, level of disclosure of of sexual abuse which wasn't there at the even though the men who came to our service had had multiple contacts with professionals they typically hadn't been identified as having a history of sexual abuse or, or rape, but 65% of them had when they'd been in treatment, been able to disclose that. So it's quite mm-hmm. shocking, really, to think of people's needs not being met. It's the language again. And, and I think, you know, if you if you say, I think, I think there are some out there that would say, if you say to a boy or a man, have you ever experienced sexual abuse in your life? And they will go, no, we go, oh, okay, no then. But actually we need to do a little bit more digging. It's like, well, what, 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 how do you define sexual abuse? Um, I, you know, I, I know of one guy and I, I can say this because I've got his permission, but his, his uh, partner was sort of drunk. She was on top of him. She was forcing him to penetrate her about how she wanted a baby. And he was saying, get off, get off. I don't want on all of that sort of stuff. He ended up pushing her off. There was a whole hoo-ha that followed. Um, but he, he didn't see that as sexual abuse. He did not see that as sexual abuse at all. And I think, again, it came as because of actually, well, what's your idea of sexual abuse? What's the education you've had in school? And often it's quite a simple thing. So if that was the other way around, you know, if, if she was trying to get to sleep and um, you were on top of her drunk and she was saying, no, get off. And he went, well, that's rape, isn't it? 
I went, okay, so, so what's the difference then? And again, through some discussions, it was a case of, you know, what, what, what are we doing? And I think now the, the prevailing female victim, male perpetrator narrative and all the other often hateful comments that go with it, it it's kind of, we're silencing boys and men even more, I believe. That's what we're doing, you know, we're picking up newspapers saying, speak, you know, mums and dads, speak to your sons. And it's like, what, do, 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 do girls not need to know about the importance of giving and respect? It's like, actually, we need to be teaching girls and boys the importance of giving respect and so on. So I think there's, it's a really rigidly binary narrative that sometimes is promoted, and it just, it just doesn't help. Great. So at one point, uh, Phil, you were heading up a national project on male sexual exploitation, and you almost tripled referrals of boys to child sex, sexual exploitation services. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? What did you do to make that happen? You know, when I was read, when Naomi sent me the questions and I was reading it, I went, I didn't do that. What did I do? And I thought, oh yes, of course I did. <laughs> Can't, that went out of my mind. Yeah, so, um, so it was uh, a project called Excellence for Boys uh, or Excellence for Boys Project. And um, there was myself and two other members of staff that we sort of worked with and trained up who had a certain amount of experience. The point of the project was that we that we try and work with uh, 20 child sexual exploitation services across England. And the point was that we worked with them to help them develop services for boys, make things better for boys and get more boys um, identified uh, to be referred to the service. So these were boys who had disclosed abuse or boys that were assessed as being at risk of child sexual exploitation. Um, so we worked with 20 CSE services. Uh, I think the one, the furthest down south was in Plymouth. The furthest up north was in Newcastle. And it was over a period of two years. Uh, cumulatively, when we started working with these services, they altogether, cumulatively, they were working with 91 boys. By the time we'd finished working with them, they were working with 249 boys. And so um, for us, that was just proof that, you know, the Children's Commissioner, Bernardo's various research and studies that were around around the time were saying, if you are a child sexual exploitation service working with girls and boys, you've got to adopt a more proactive approach to find boys, get the boys and encourage those referrals. Well, we kind of knew that anyway. So we thought, let's get some more evidence to back it up. And that's what the Excellence for Boys project found. Um, some of the services were great to work with. Some that shall remain nameless were a nightmare to work with. But that's another story. Um, but the reason, and I think there's two reasons, the, the two main reasons why those male referrals increased as they did was the training and the passion. And so... Um, I delivered a lot of training about gender biased practice. You know, look at these case studies here. What would you think if this was a girl? What's the difference? Notice how when this child becomes, goes from being a boy to a girl, your risk increases, girl to a boy, it decreases. Why is that? Could it, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so we did a lot of training around that. And it's, a, you know, hopefully when lockdown ends, I'll be doing more of that training instead of doing it all on webinars and things like that. But the second reason was the passion of some of the professionals we worked with. It was, it kind of filled me with so much hope that there were so many professionals out there, not everyone I have to say, but the majority that we encountered were going, you know, Phil, we, 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 we are based here. We need to have more boys. We, you know, some were saying we haven't had a boy referred to us in two years. That's not right. There's something going on. We've got to find more boys. They've got to be out there. What's happening? And, um, and, and that passion, along with the training, really was a great combination. And the particular service that had said we haven't had a boy referred in two years um, had, I think, two or three referred after the, we delivered the training, because it was about challenging that gender by practice. If you're in that multi-agency meeting and you can see professionals saying, right, we're worried about this girl, she's going missing, she's hanging around with this older bloke, she's not in school, she's turned up at home with a bag of weed and what's how she got it from, oh, could it be CSE, refer, assess and so on. But then boys in exactly the same position or very similar positions. Oh, it's probably crime, it's probably drugs, we don't need to do, oh, oh. it's like, well, hang on a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we kind of gave some practitioners the confidence to challenge that and go, Actually, it might be CSE. It might not be, but actually, there's, if you're saying that that's enough for the girl, but it's not enough for the boy, are you giving that boy a less favourable response? 
because he's a boy. I'm not sure what the 2010 Equality Act would say about that. And you've got to be careful there. And it, it made people think, oh, yeah, OK. So people were open to being challenged and people were open to challenge. Some weren't. And that was another issue, as I say. But that is another reason why the, the male referrals increased. Sounds like those, so, you know, that's that particular service that you spoke about that was where there's a curiosity about why are we not hearing these stories? Um, you know, then there's an, an openness or a willingness to hear whatever the client's got to, to bring, isn't there? Um, absolutely. I think it's good advice to people, really. No, absolutely. And they, they, you know, they got very good links with the youth offending team. So the vast, you know, I'm sure we know the vast majority of youth offending services across the country work with more boys and girls. And what we found was that there were youth offending teams referring girls that were displaying certain warning signs. And some, some teams had said, well, we can't refer the boys. And we go, well, why can't you? Well, because that's, that's nearly every single boy that we know. But that, that's not a reason to not refer them. So, so, so you, the, the, your, the minority of service users, you've got something like 95% or 90% girl, uh, boys in your service. You've got 10% girls. You have referred most of those 10% because they're hanging around with all the men. They're going missing, all the usual warning signs. But the boys who are displaying those signs, you're not referring them. And one of the reasons you're not referring them is because there's a lot of them silence tumbleweed rolls past <laughs> and we don't want to shame people you know when i don't believe in all of that we don't want to shame people into doing things but it's about getting them to just look at it rationally and thinking let's just break that down and actually no this might not be cse but it might be and if it's enough to refer the girl it should absolutely be enough to refer the boy thank you and you've referred a couple of times to misandry do you think misandry plays a role in the lack of acknowledgement of male <laughs> victimization um, Yes, in an answer. Um, not in all cases, not and, and it's not it's not as as vicious as it always has to be. I think when we talk about misandry, uh, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of misandry in response to misandry. Um, so yeah, not not every single disadvantage a, a boy or a man uh, faces is because of misandry. It's not, of course, it's not. Many of them are, but I think for me, it's about when when you expect a boy or a man to tolerate a lesser response because he's a man that is misandry it might not be absolute vicious violent awful misandry but it is still misandry um and i think we we've got to start kind of naming this we've got to start saying it for what it is we've got to start saying we are expecting boys and men to put up with certain things simply because they are they are boys and men as i said no it's not always a relevant factor but but many times it can be you know um it could be argued uh, the very fact that um, there, so now, you know, when I was back in the voluntary sector where there were sort of CSE, child sexual exploitation, multi-agency teams, now a lot of them have changed to sort of general exploitation teams and they deal with child sexual exploitation and child criminal exploitation, which is all great. But um, the vast majority, I can tell you now, the vast majority of those exploitation teams across the country um, you asked to look at their stats or their data, the list of children at risk of or experiencing child sexual exploitation, mainly girls, the risk of children at risk of or experiencing criminal exploitation, mainly boys. And again, there's been research in the last three years, I think, ish, uh, that have shown that actually that data is quite accurate and so on. Why is that? And it's the, it's the things we've been talking about for ages. Well, we see a girl displaying these behaviours, we think victim support and service we see a boy displaying these same behaviors you think perpetrator criminal exploitation and while some may say yes but come on phil you know we don't we're not going to criminalize them because they are being criminally exploited the reality is in some cases we do we absolutely do we do arrest them we do things like that and it's not great <laughs> um and often these girls and boys are displaying the same behaviors so if we are responding to a girl who displays xyz indicator but a boy who displays X, Y, Z indicate differently in a way that might criminalise him, in a way that doesn't see the risk as urgent because he's a boy, then absolutely there's an element of misandry in there. I'm not saying it's a conscious decision, 
but uh, and but in some cases it might be but there's got to be an element of uh, misandry there the very fact you know you just have to look on social media and chat forums and things like that and whenever the abuse of boys and men is highlighted or any disadvantage experienced uh, experienced by boys and men is highlighted guarantee you there will be someone lurking who will jump on and go yes but who's doing it to these boys and men it's other men isn't it and if that doesn't evidence misandry i really don't know what does um because for me, it's about, well, actually, when, you know, are we really, what we're saying there is that we, it's okay to minimise the abuse experienced by someone if their perpetrator is the same gender as them? Really? I'm not sure we'd apply that to any other demographic. <laughs> and I'm not actually sure we should. So I think, yes, in some cases, it's subtle uh misandry in some cases it's unconscious in others it's blatantly obvious and sadly in some cases hateful so it depends on i think where in the spectrum the misandry lies i think it's interesting to to look at those similarities though isn't it in terms of how we treat boys and girls in their sort of early teens because i think rightly everyone was horrified by the stories that came out of roch Rochdale, for instance, and Rotherham. But actually, those stories are very, very similar to when you talk to men who were gradually inculcated into gang culture, where quite often actually being made to perform sex was part of part of that too. Um, it's hard to, you know, sometimes being made to rape as part of that, but those stories are not infrequent as as um when you when you listen to male accounts in, in prison, and yet they're not really present or visible in the public consciousness in the way that people have have come to recognise that girls uh, are sexually exploited in this Mm. way. Well, the Rotherham incident is is quite a poignant one because uh, when I, you know, so again, before COVID and all of that, uh, I I remember I was in Derby and I was delivering uh, my my two-day training event. And the first day is all about identifying boys. Why don't we identify them? How can we identify more? And uh, I refer to Rotherham. And I ask everyone a question and I go, so um, the the J report and the Casey report that came out after Rotherham, uh, one of, I think it's the, I, I always get them mixed up, so you have to bear with me, but I think it was the J report. Um, apologies if I've got that wrong. Um, but I ask everyone a question. I say, so in the J report, it highlights the sexual exploitation uh, that went on in Rotherham. And I go, how many boys in that report were highlighted as experiencing child sexual exploitation in Rotherham. How many? And everybody goes zero. The answer is 80. And people don't know that. Why don't people know that? Because we focused on the girls. That's why. And, um, you know, it's interesting because the report, I think, gets a bit confusing because in one part it says 80, another part it says 70. So I think the wording might be a bit complicated, but it does say, you know, that, you know, we need to do more with boys and everything. But, you know, at the time when it was in the news, it was all these girls, all these girls, no wrong with that. But it was like, hello, there's there's, there's 80 boys here as well that absolutely got, why? because we're boys that's that's why all you have to do is uh so if you look at um recently there was uh in the news uh the the that i think currently uh last year i think it was 30 boys and young men had been killed by knife crime right 30 boys and young men had been killed by knife crime right it's the highest it's ever been i think it was in london and when uh, certain newspapers ran with this story it was 30 young people if that if that had been girls and girls and young women you can guarantee it would have said girls and women but because it was boys and young men it was like why can't you say boys and young men why can't you do that and i think it's because it, we, we are very quickly moving towards this this sort of society because we we cannot and should not address the suffering of boys and men at all that's that takes it away from the narrative we want to peddle and it's like hang on a minute no what we need to do is say that there are ways girls and women are disproportionately suffering disadvantaged etc there are ways boys and men are disproportionately suffering and disadvantaged when we are making it you know a, a competition for victimhood it's not a great look and it's not very helpful it's not very empowering um and when we start to peddle the whole narrative that well you know if you're if the perpetrator or the person who harmed you is the same, you know, sex or gender as you. Well, we, it doesn't really matter, does it? And it, it's almost as if that actually, if a person is harmed, 
we will only care and focus on it if it's by someone of the opposite gender why why does that why does that matter it should be the behavior we should be focusing on we should understand the differences but also the similarities thank you and phil what, what advice do you have for psychologists and psychotherapists working with boys and men that might help make it easier for males to disclose their histories um well i read <laughs> read certainly read the power Grove handbook of male psychology certainly read uh, perspectives in male psychology uh because there's just a lot of science in there there's a lot of literature that's referenced that just makes sense um as i started to say a moment ago i was quite embarrassed a few years ago because i i did think and i'm embarrassed to say it, but i didn't masculine it was bad and i'm embarrassed to say that but i thought well why do i think that and i think it's because i thought well i was bullied in school by boys interestingly I was bullied by girls as well but anyway bullied by all these boys and and you know my dad was someone who was a bit of a quiet person and all of that and all of this silly stuff kind of thought well yeah masculinity is bad if we men were a little bit more like women and we you know looked at femininity but when I read these books it just made so much sense it just made so much sense and and you just couldn't argue with it and I realized that I was being absolutely ideological basing my opinions on things that were, were not really scientific coming up with wild assumptions and and whilst I was very much of the of, of the let's just ignore what science says it's all about how we bring people up and all that I think now I'm in a, in a more balanced place where it's like well actually let's say what nature and nurture says and 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 value both and look at both and how they interwined with each other so certainly if you haven't already done it, certainly have a look at the Powell Grave Handbook of Male Psychology, download chapters from the website. If you can't afford to buy the book, look at the uh, book by Louise Lydon and John Barry on perspectives in male psychology and, and kind of look up all the, the how masculinity can be used as a really useful tool to help boys and men overcome abuse. You know, um, look at language, look at the language you use. Sometimes, um, uh, you know, I often say to some guys, well, actually, maybe don't, you don't have to see this as therapy. Just see it as two guys working professionally to try and solve some problems and figure things out. Yeah. The amount of times I've said to uh, some of the guys I've worked with that um, actually you're not struggling here. You're not you're not doing that. Maybe what you're doing is you're trying to find a solution to solve a problem. And they often go, oh. Oh, I like that. Oh, yeah, that is what I'm doing, isn't it? I suppose I am trying to solve the problem. So ultimately, you're using different language, like doing, action, um, solutions, things like that, taking control. Uh, I remember I gave that advice to someone once, and they went, oh, so you, you're trying to get men to be controlling. And I'm sitting there, like, rolling my eyes, going, well, well, you could say it like that, but it's the context. You know, I'm not getting him to control his partner and control what his partner does or wears. I'm getting him to think about how he can control his life in, in a way that feels right for him. So it's all those sorts of words where we reframe things um, and just look at different perspectives, often using elements of masculinity to help us do that. Sounds as well from, I guess, picking up on um, some of what's come up earlier on in the interview as well as the conversation has been the idea of familiarise yourself with some of the facts of the situation as well and the reality, because some of the uh, get that, it's, it might be hard to do that when people aren't easily voicing um, or articulating what's happened to them, but you're actually bringing up lots of facts that are in the public domain. So, for instance, the number of boys that are involved in, in the inquiry that you referred to. Mm. So, and the Office of National Statistics is useful. I, I, you know, I've found mm. that useful in terms of looking at um, sex of, of who's killed on the streets and actually mm. only 10% of... Um, women who are killed are killed on the street where 38% yep. of men who are killed are killed on the street and a lot more men are killed than women anyway mm -hmm. and yet I think the way the story and narrative plays out as a woman you end up being a lot more frightened about walking home on your own than you would do as a, a man so something about seeking out the facts of what's readily available within the public domain isn't that absolutely and I think within that there's also about consider other sources you know, just remember what the Office of National Statistics is and how it does link to the Crime in England and Wales survey and, and actually think about what do other sources say, you know, think about the context, you know, there's, I think there's something like, oh, well, at, at least over 300 studies um, that talk, that, that look at sort of violence and domestic abuse and cumulatively they basically say that 
women perpetrate violence at similar rates to men. But because that is not in the Office of National Statistics, we, we ignore it. And a lot of people have never heard of it. So it's about kind of looking at um, all of the information, all of the sources, um, rather than just one, sticking with that because it fits your narrative. Um, it's also about, you know, be, being professional enough and decent enough to hold your hands up and go, I got that wrong. Okay. You know, I'm not perfect. I made mistakes all the time. I probably made them today. I've probably made loads in this interview. Um, but it's about kind of holding your hands up. I didn't know that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's useful to know. You know, don't be so so rigid and, and think actually, okay, then maybe there are things that I can learn. Maybe there are things I didn't know. And as you say, Naomi, it is about, well, what, what do the facts say? But I think the media has sort of whipped us up into such a frenzy. Uh, there are, and I've seen certain discussions online that I have looked at from afar, but not got involved in, where people genuinely believe that a lot more women are being killed on the street than men, despite the data saying that's not true. Um, and, you know, not to minimise any of these experiences, of course, but I'm thinking, wow, what, what's got you to the point where you believe that? And the answer from comments that I've seen is the media. You believe what the media sees because they've whipped you up into this massive frenzy. So I think sometimes, and, I, you know, I probably can say I talk quite passionately. Sometimes we have to try and curb our passion. I've certainly made mistakes, I can tell you that. But we have to try and curb our passion. I think, well, what, what logically, let's look at this. What does it, what do we know logically? What do we know rationally? What can we, we kind of learn from that and let's not use sort of emotion to such an extent to be making decisions in the way that we are let's use a good balance of logic and emotion do you think there's a there's kind of a, a hierarchy of um victims and their appeal to empathy you know so in terms of if a, if a victim's a child of course there's a uni- universal um abhorrence at, at, at those kind of crime rightly so obviously and but then I wonder if women then become if it you know if it's not a child victim women become somehow it's easier to feel sorry for women than it is to feel sorry for men I don't you know just that recent story about those those young men that were um that were killed you know where the police had, t- had taken really quite a homophobic response to to their killing so actually he seemed to have got away with with crimes for longer but you know just wondering about this whether there is this hierarchy that we're, we can all find ourselves falling into in some ways i think there is a i, I think there's a there's a desperate attempt from many to set up a hierarchy um in various ways i mean you know we we you just have to look at the violence against women and girls strategy we don't you know and as you were saying naomi the the overall you know, not not nuances and specifics. Overall, the vast majority of violence experienced in in this country is by men. The vast majority of people who kill are by men. And so, again, not to dismiss anything that girls and women go through, but what I find is quite ironic is that the, the even the ONS are saying that by their own data that the vast majority of victims of violence and um, murder are men but we don't have a violence against men and boys strategy, despite the fact that they are most of the victims of violence. That makes no sense. And what we have is we have this, what I call a poor male victims position statement, I think it's called, that is, I think, nine, seven or nine pages compared to the actual violence against women and girls strategy, which is significantly more detailed. And what we've heard is we've heard uh, Priti Patel, uh, well, we, what we said, we've seen that she has said in the uh, violence against women and girls strategy that came out last year, the, the refreshed version. And um, I will be publishing my work regarding male victims before the end of 2021. We're still waiting. How long will we be waiting for? Does anyone care because it's just boys and men? So I think that that's one example that sets up this sort of hierarchy. Um, of victims. We just have to look at the, the controversy that happened a few weeks ago with the, um, the woman who broke down at the side of the motorway and the AA got involved and they were saying that they don't they don't give people preferential treatment based on gender. And and the, the response was that, well, no, I'm a woman and I'm on my own. So I, I you know, I should be treated differently. That's equality. It literally is not, is it? <laughs> and so there's something there about what, 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 you know, where do we draw the line? What, so I think we are setting up a hierarchy of victims. We're certainly as a society, I think, behaving as if there's a hierarchy of victims. And the people 
at the bottom of that hierarchy are boys and men because we see that they are perpetrators before they are victims. Um, but actually, again, it's not as it's not as black and white as that. It's much more nuanced. And I think we just have to accept, as I said earlier, that, that there are ways males and females perpetrate harm and there are ways males and females experience harm. There are similarities, but there are also differences. And, um, you know, as I've said, we, we shouldn't just look at the ONS. We should look at other sources as well. There, you know, there was a, I think there was a, a social experiment done a, oh, it was a few years ago now where there was a camera set up in a park and members of the public sort of walked past um, sort of a, 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 a stranded boy, a stranded girl, a stranded dog, a stranded cat. I can't remember um, the, the person out of all four of those, the, 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 the person or the, the, the being, should we say, who got the least response was the boy. The girl, the cat and the dog got responded to more than the boy. Others just walked past the boy. Yeah. And again, it's, it, 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 it's that rigid stereotype of, well, boys are bad and boys are abusive you know we we you know if if you know boys and men at the bottom of the hierarchy ladder they are certainly put right at the top of the perpetrator ladder despite the fact that the vast majority of people who are going to take action to stop these male abusers or other men and that's what we don't that's what we forget when we to when when the misandrists online are very much ah yeah but who's abusing these boys or the men it was it was who's hurting all these men or the men and, and and in some cases absolutely but not in all but what we don't hear ah yeah but but who's saving all these people men you know generally speaking who's at, who who's actually risking their lives to save these people men yeah who are the first responders the rescue workers the firefighters the police all that yes there are of course women within that but the vast majority of people within that are men so we seem to be focusing more on yeah but look at the harm men are doing with the minority but we're not looking at the good the majority are doing finally phil working with victims of sexual trauma can be very heavy and painful how do you protect yourself from being harmed by the work that you do i make sure well there's i have a very good supervisor first of all and i see her every month for a good couple of hours and we really you know we, we really kind of, sort of battle things out and that i need that support and i want that support and that's good um but also having time where i do something that's absolutely nothing to do with this at all so you know going out with friends and socializing and, and having a laugh sometimes i will end up falling into into the trap you know if i'm out with friends of friends who will say something like oh well men are all just rapists that's actually happened um i have to try and bite my tongue especially if i had a drink or but sometimes i go hang on a minute that's not true though is it and that's not really helpful uh but the other things that i'll do is i'll, I'll spend time with friends Every, you, you most friday nights i have a quiz online where i speak to people and we take the mick out of each other and we have a laugh and a bit of banter so that's great um focusing on other things as well so I've got I've got a cat and he takes up a lot of my time and and so on my partner and I we we kind of like to drive around and visit places never seen before um I like to watch some great um binge worthy box sets on Netflix and I like to embarrass myself by telling really cringe worthy dad jokes as well and I, all, all of that is a very thing that's very separate from all of this and I think everyone needs some sort of separation from it because it can be very exhausting work Absolutely. Thank you very much, Phil. That was brilliant. Really, really interesting to hear your thoughts and observations. OK. Thanks a lot, Phil. It's good to hear Phil's analysis of the situation, actually, and digging into the data. I was, you know, shocked to hear that kind of like the lives of 80 boys in the CSE inquiry just being written off as a as as if they were almost nothing um when certainly it certainly resonates with my experience that people in prison have often been drawn into certainly gang related crime via a route which has included a process that of grooming that's quite similar to that that you see in in girls yeah i agree i was i was uh, struck by some of those comments as well and uh, clearly he's a guy who's got a lot of um, interest and energy about uh, his uh, his his subject which uh, was very powerful um, and it took me back to a couple of quotations from poems that I'd actually used um, 
at the the front of my Working with Dangerous People um, book. I'll just read them out. They're not very long. A mad animal. Man's a mad animal. I'm a thousand years old, and in my time I've helped commit a million murders. The earth is spread. The earth is spread thick with squashed human guts. And that's by Peter Weiss, who was a continental writer, who wrote that it's from his play Marat Saad. And the second snippet was by Vladimir Mayakovsky, and he wrote, On the pavement of my trampled soul, the souls of madmen stamp the prints of crude, rude words. And I found both of those extremely powerful. And of course, they they seem to represent the kind of extremes of the human uh, condition. And that uh, often our kind of battle when we're working and doing therapy with people is to find a way of having a thoughtful dialogue about some of these extremes. And uh, that came back to me during this conversation brilliant i thought there was those quotes are brilliant actually yeah, really, um, they are powerful, really they? No, yeah they're very powerful and a really nice way to wrap wrap that up